Hi everyone, Lisa and Dan here from Fireside Strategic. We're on a mission to help business leaders achieve great results through human-centered strategy. We believe that businesses don't need to choose between investing in their humans and generating profit because it's the humans that create profit. In the Fireside Chat series, we're showcasing how leaders are transcending the challenges of the COVID-19 crisis and more broadly unite strategic and human thinking in leadership. Today, we're excited to chat with Lynn Powers, CEO of Masami Hair Care. Lynn, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Could, yeah. you, could you tell our audience a little bit more about who you are and what your story is? Oh my gosh, that's a very large question, but um, we have sure. time. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm I'm a longtime advertising executive, i.e., old, because um, I spent 30, 30 years in the business. Um, most recently, I was running ad agencies. I was the CEO of J. Walter Thompson New York, and before that, um, I ran Arnold New York. And um, about two years ago, I just decided, you know, why am I building all these brands for other people? I need to do it for myself. So I started a brand consultancy and thereafter, shortly thereafter, um, met up with uh, my, my hair care partner and we launched Matsumi, just launched in February. It took us about a year and a half to get everything you know, ready. So that's, that's what I'm doing. And could you tell us a little bit more about Masami? Yeah, so Masami is clean premium hair care. It's um, infused with a Japanese ocean botanical called Mikabu that comes from Northeast Japan. That's all about hydration. So it just, it basically acts like a sponge to your hair to just give you, you know, massive hydration. And um, I've worked on tons and tons of beauty before. And I know from my L'Oreal days that hydration is the number one unmet need for consumers. So when you solve that for people, you basically make their hair amazing. You know, it's shiny, it's healthy, it's manageable, it looks great. It's, um, you know, everything that they kind of complain about kind of goes away when you solve the hydration. So that's what our brand is all about. And it's actually quite hard to do in hair care because most clean hair care is um, pretty unfulfilling, but ours is super high performing. Are you at liberty to disclose or discuss just a little bit how you came up with the idea for that solution? So sure, um, my partner James um, worked on the formulations for 10 years by himself, kind of like this passion project. He had worked at Clairol for over 20 years and was dealing with all the models who, cause he was like the Uber producer, was booking the shoots and the models. And he was dealing with the models who were like, oh my God, my hair is fried because you people just colored it and colored it back and now I have to, deal with this, you know, awful hair. And so he um, he's married to a Japanese man named Masa, who was our muse. So now you get the Masami, although that also coincidentally means truly beautiful in Japanese, um, which was a nice serendipity. So James would go back to Masa's hometown and was always amazed at how young and healthy everyone is like Masa's whole family his mother looks like she's you know younger than me right and she <laughs> um, but they look amazing and so he um, started doing some investigating into all the the things they were doing and realized they were eating and also putting in their personal care routines but eating this um, Japanese ocean botanical Mikabu mm. which comes right from the bay but then they would also grind it up and put it in their skincare and hair care. So he started playing around with it. Um, it took like 10 years because it's really hard to do when you take out the bad ingredients that we're all like super accustomed to because they're actually sulfates, parabens, phthalates. They're basically detergents. Mm. But mm. You know, we, you, uh, us, you know, U.S. consumers have a feeling our hair needs to be like squeaky clean. Um, or we don't um, think it's clean, and that's actually not good. <laughs> huh. So anyway, I'm giving you a lot of information here. But so the, you asked me about how it came to be. James um, had this idea. He was playing around with the ingredient. He found a chemist in Chicago. He worked on it for almost 10 years. I met him, and I was like, you're crazy. Who are you? Why, why would you do this by yourself for 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of was like, the products can't. Be that good I mean come on you've been doing it by yourself but then I tried the products and I was like oh damn this 
guy has really figured it out. And we decided to partner together to launch it. Very cool. And one of the insights that comes up for me is as entrepreneurs, we want to build something new. We can be very forceful about trying to figure it out in our heads. And sometimes if we get that tunnel vision, we miss out on the learning that is all around us and travel in particular. If you want to expose yourself to a radically different culture and you're thinking entrepreneurially, there's a pretty damn good chance you're going to come back from that trip with a whole bunch of business ideas. I know every time I go to Japan, I'm immediately thinking, oh my God, like there's so many ideas here. I totally agree. I went to Japan with James and Masa for the first time about 18 months ago, and it was just absolutely awesome. And I also discovered this completely, I didn't know it existed there, but amazing craft cocktail culture, <laughs> uh, which was really cool and fun. Yeah. We could out about that for a while. Uh, yeah, that was several nights of, uh, of, of fun in Tokyo, but yeah. I love the kind of your choice coming from a very generalist background, focusing on hair care. As kind of a female in the business world, hair is this unspoken, super important thing. I've noticed that the way that, you know, the world around you perceives you, your hair has a big impact. The way that you perceive yourself, hair is such a big impact, but it's something that in a more male dominated industry isn't discussed much. I'm just curious how, like, how do you view this role of, you know, hair care in the business world more broadly and why you chose to dive into this? I mean, I guess I've always loved working on beauty. I've done tons of it in my career. And for whatever reason, I've worked on lots of hair care. And um, I actually launched Gillette Series Hair Care for Men. I don't even know the date. It was so long ago. I can't even remember. But it was way before its time. Um, I don't even think it's on the market anymore. But anyway... Um, yeah, hair is, is definitely an interesting thing. Like I said, I am like a very low involvement hair person because I basically do this. Can you see the hair sticks? That's my thing. That's what I do every day. It's easy. Um, my hair just is just thin and like not great. So that's my go-to. But I will say for a lot of people, like you're saying, um, their hair is almost like the thing that they show off. And... Um, there are people who are just really, really hair involved and really think a lot about their products. And it's actually like a pain point for a lot of people because as I mentioned before, <clears throat> there aren't a lot of great options if you like clean beauty and more and more people are starting to figure out that they don't want toxic shit in their, <laughs> in their things they're putting on their body and in their body. So, you know, hair care is kind of a, 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 a laggard in the beauty industry to catch up to clean beauty. Um, skin care has been much more um, on the forefront, but now I think people are realizing, oh, you're rubbing that into your scalp. <laughs> Maybe you want to think about, you know, what you're, what you're using. So that's um, a big part of it. But you're right, like hair, hair in business, um, you know, people, it can make or break how you feel about your confidence. Mm -hmm. If you have a good, good hair day or bad hair day, it's, it can literally be like you're going and crushing it or you're just like, ooh, I'm just not feeling it today. Yeah, I love that. I would love to change gears a little bit. Um, yeah. We've talked in the past, uh, when we talked before this interview, you mentioned a lot, a little bit about your leadership style and your leadership philosophy. And I was very inspired by it. It's not a conversation going back, sorry, Dan, to the kind of a more male dominated business world. It's not as talked about as often how, what it's like to be a female leader and how the business world is changing as more women become leaders. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your leadership philosophy as the CEO of Masami, but also having led branding and marketing companies in the past. Yeah, I mean, I've always believed in empowering people to do what they do best. And the tricky thing about being a leader is figuring that out. What do people do best? Because sometimes what they think they do best is not actually what they do best. <laughs> and you have to kind of redirect or refocus them or illuminate um, what their superpowers actually are and kind of refocus them. But, you know, I think for me, one of my superpowers has always been building high performing teams. You know, people that can really gel together where their skill sets 
um, really complement each other. And then just letting them go, you know? It's, I'm not a micromanager at all. Um, I'm very aware of the things I'm not good at. <laughs> I don't like spending my time in spreadsheets and finance and sorry, my CFO loves it. He literally does breathtaking spreadsheets and loves it, but that is not my thing. So I think it's about like figuring out what you're good at and where you need to supplement the people around you and then letting them do what they're best at and empowering them to do it. And you know, make sure they have the tools, make sure they have the help and the support, but just don't get in their way. <laughs> the executive coach within me is very curious to pick up on one thing you said, which is sometimes people don't always get right what they're good at. Yeah. So when you need to have a conversation with someone to kind of redirect their energies, how do you do that? You know, it's it's clear sometimes when somebody's struggling, you know, in, in a role you're putting them in and you know, sometimes it's it's just sitting down and really trying to unpack that. You know, what's going on? Why is it so hard? Um, what are your expectations for yourself? You know, why why do you feel that you know this is something that you know you have to do this way? And sometimes I'll find out that you know somebody really had it in their head that to be successful in advertising, I'll use you know I'm going to talk advertising centric since that's the bulk of my experience there. Um, you know, they'll say, well, I really feel like I have to be an account person. And I'm like, but you actually love project management. You don't love dealing with the client. You don't, you know, like everything you're saying that you love to do is actually a different role. Um, and just because you're a project manager doesn't mean you're not successful in the business. It's, it's, you're just going to be functioning um, in a, in a different way. And in a way that's the grease that makes everything go. So Sometimes it's just having people realize, oh yeah, that would actually be a better fit for me and that is more what I like to do and kind of opening up the lane to let them go shift and do that. Mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise they just struggle, you know, they just struggle and struggle and it's like, <laughs> yeah, not yeah. a good ending for anybody. Yeah, yeah. wasted energy. Um, yeah. And two things come up for me there. One is that it takes some courage to have that conversation when someone's expectations are so wedded to this is the thing I want to do and be right. It takes some courage on your part to, to have that conversation. The, the second quick insight I want to throw at you and Lisa helps me a lot with this is it's so easy to when we're in the middle of a work day, go into tunnel vision mode, like I was saying earlier, and to not think about why are we doing the things we're doing when you can just ask that simple question it can lead to a lot of rethinking about, huh, should I be spending my time this way? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, it's really, really easy. And I feel like the last few years, it's gotten even easier to get stuck in the weeds. You know, just to, just to spend your time dealing with the fires that are like right in front of you. And part of it is, you know, the clients are dealing with fires every day. Um, and they've kind of, a lot of them, I don't want to mean to make a like broad statement, but a lot of them have lost their long-term filter in a way. So everything feels very short-termitis. And um, I think you do have to kind of figure out how to step back, look at the big picture. You know, is this really working? Is this what you want to be doing? Are we driving towards something bigger? Or are we just making widgets, you know? Um, and, and that, that really helps, but it's hard to balance those two things often. You know, it's, I, I see people that either, have you ever heard the, the kite and the, the rock and the kite analogy? Oh, there are people that are kites who are visionary and, you know, always forward thinking and way out there. And then there are the rocks who are the ones grounded and dealing with um, the pragmatic realities of day to day, but you need both. You know, you can't be one or the other. You you need you need people that are that are both on the team to kind of even things out. If you only have kites, you know, you're never going to get anything done. And if you only have rocks, you're not going to look ahead. I I love that analogy. I think that's very pertinent to team building and building a startup. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna harp back to a conversation we had earlier one more time, probably the last time. Sure. Um, Last time we talked, you mentioned that the book, The Athena Doctrine, yes. has had a massive impact on you and the way that you lead. Would you mind speaking about that a little bit more? 
Yeah, um, it was written by an ad guy, which I love. Um, but, and it's a few years old now. It's probably, I don't know, maybe six or eight years old. But um, it was great because um, it really reinforced the idea that you can embrace leadership qualities that are not sort of seen as traditional leadership qualities. And that, in fact, the qualities that are emerging as the, the better qualities of a leader are things like transparency, vulnerability, uh, communication, you know, some of the things we've been talking about, um, as opposed to confidence, um, you know, I was going to say arrogance, but, you know, like traditional masculine qualities of, le of leadership. So the whole book was basically about how, you know, female leadership traits are becoming the leadership traits for the future, which I think is great. And they're not just, it's not just female leadership traits. They tend to be more female, but men can have those too. It's just um, when you kind of associate conventional leadership, the way you think about it, you know, if you think about Trump, is <laughs> um, there is a, you know, lead, leading with a hammer approach there. Um, as opposed to, you know, the way someone else, Michelle Obama might handle something, you know, very different. Are you saying that I should drop my whole Don Draper act? Should I <laughs> throw that out the window? Not at all. Go for it. <laughs> and for our audience, the book is The Athena Doctrine by John Gersimum. Yeah. Yeah, it's just interesting because he gives a lot of really great examples of leaders who are embracing those qualities. I think it's really hard for women to show vulnerability sometimes because it just feels like it's a weakness that reinforces your, you know, femaleness. Um, and I, I guess when I started deciding that, you know what, I don't care, <laughs> I'm going to just do what I do and people will either like it or they won't, but I'm not going to try to be a different type of leader. I'm going to try to just be myself, but with a hopefully, you know, enough self-awareness um, to be able to pivot and, and evolve. But I think when people try to emulate leadership that they see that's not them, it doesn't work. Yes. There, there's a leadership. It's, it's interesting. I was the other day reflecting on this idea that there's really well, one simple mental model and there's, there's many is that, you know, there's a form of leadership that is all about, you it's all about the leader right and it's all about we could call trump a, a pretty good encapsulation of this what does he want and how can he impose his will on others right then there's a second kind of leadership which is an, ena an enabling leadership right an enabling leadership why can't i pronounce that word and when you can really get into the shoes of someone else and you know it's a leadership that's more about question asking than it is statements yep. it's a leadership that's less about imposition and more about I think it harkens back to one of the things we were talking earlier. Most people don't take that big picture. Running around, putting out the flyers that we haven't taken the time to get clear on our own objectives. And when you can dispassionately and just curiously, because you actually care, ask the others to clarify, what do you really want? That alone is, I think, a step up in leadership for most people. Yeah, and it's actually not hard to do if you think about it, because at the end of the day, like you just want everybody to be doing their best, right? Like it's it's yeah. like super basic, you know. And it, but yeah, I agree. I mean, with that, what you said. Brilliant. That, that part is easy. I agree that the the helping people clarify their objectives, the hard part for most for men and women in my experience for all humans, is the vulnerability piece the yeah. real courage to say when you made a mistake, at least for me, I'm just so used to years of lawyering before I became a coach, I built up an entire armor around how right I am all the time. Mm -hmm. And to let that get broken down, at least for me, that, that part is much harder. I don't know, you know, I think it maybe used to be harder, but these days there's so much we don't know <laughs> that, you know, even the idea of having mentors, they should be like, younger like my my teenage daughter is 16 and teaches me stuff all the time so does my 19 year old right but like the world is just so complicated now that it's quite easy to be like i have 
no idea <laughs> you know, how to do TikTok. Like, what is that all about? Please fill me in. And, you know, so um, where I think it used to be, like, not that, you know, it wasn't that way. So, you know, you didn't want to admit that you didn't know how something worked or whatever. But now I think it's fine. <laughs> I love it. I, th I think you make a great point about how leadership is evolving as yes. you know, our culture has evolved, business culture has evolved, and as things have become more uncertain, we have to lean into our vulnerability to even keep business running. Yeah, I mean, if you just go by an old school playbook of what you knew five years ago or even two years ago, forget it. It's like that, you know, so I've got a DTC brand, right? And DTC was like the hot thing, you know, a couple of years ago with, you know, Casper and all these cool DTC brands. And then now DTC is sort of starting to get a bad rap. Like, well, can they really make money? Is it really profitable? What's the ROI? And um, like anything else, I, I realize like, it's actually not, the model needs to evolve again. Like DTC is one way to go to market. But now when I talk about what we're doing, I say it's DTC plus. And the plus is you can't only be an online brand. You have to have a physical presence too, especially if you're in beauty. People want to touch, see, smell, look, you know, they want to just experience your product, not just on the computer <laughs> first um, or on their phone first, I should say. Um, so, you know, I think the DTC model is going to see an evolution as well. And obviously now with retailers and COVID, I mean, that's going to completely, it's been slowly, it's been dying a slow death. Right, like we've been seeing it like death by a thousand paper cuts, but now I think it just all like imploded. So we're gonna have, you know, it'll be interesting to see what emerges from the ashes, right? So, you know, diving into this challenge of COVID-19, you mentioned earlier that you decided to go to market with Masami in February. Yeah. Um, pretty tricky time. Can you tell us a little bit more about what your initial strategy was and how it's had to evolve because of yeah. the very, very uncertain circumstances. Yeah, so um, we launched at New York Fashion Week. I think I said to you, like, hard to imagine just a couple of months ago, we were um, crammed in these small rooms that were, you know, over capacity, watching fashion shows. Um, it's just like surreal now to think that that was, that was just a couple months ago. Seems like it was years, but um, so that's how we launched, and we also launched in a couple of luxury boutiques. So we have one in D.C. and one in L.A. They obviously shut down. Um, so, And we were also having um, pretty in-depth conversations with several salons because that's part of our strategy. You know, the, again, the world, the channels are blurred. So, you know, it used to be that you were either a salon brand or you weren't, and now you don't really have to – you can be in salons and be an online brand and what and whatnot. But um, anyway, so we obviously stopped all of our distribution and salon conversations, uh, put those on hold or pause those, and just kind of doubled down on our digital acquisition, social media content, um, and our current users. You know, we're 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 new a new brand, but we have about twenty percent repeat already. Um, so my feeling is, you know what? Let's just focus there. Um, and uh, not lose sight of that and use the time to actually build our foundation and our, our you know, the content that we need, which takes, takes a lot of work. <laughs> so that's what we've been doing. I love that you have taken this time to continue to build your brand. I think that's such a smart, it's a smart thing to do. You know what, on one hand, distribution has stopped, but you're getting a lot more people that are sitting in front of their computers and yep. soaking in information. And a lot of people experimenting with hair on top of that. So yeah. I think that's a really smart switch in how you're spending your time. Yeah, it's worked pretty well for us. Um, you know, we had a dip in sales in March and then it's picked back up. And I think because people really want self-care right now, um, and I think they're kind of more interested in clean beauty. And they were already, that was a trend, but I think it's picked up even more. So we'll see. Hopefully it's it's good. <laughs> that trend continues, you know. I'm sure it will. Um, so kind of 
leaning into that, you know, hopefully things will start to calm down a little bit. And what are some of your broader goals for Masami, uh, you know, after this pandemic, hopefully soon? Um, yeah. After so we are um, a brand that cares a lot about sustainability and we're very pro ocean, I say. Um, when we built the brand, we created the Masami Institute, which is a nonprofit that helps fund research in Northeast Japan to kind of rebuild that ocean ecosystem that was devastated by the tsunami back in 2011 and still hasn't come back. So that's a big part of what our brand is. And to that end, we're actually launching a sustainable, refillable bottle to try to get rid of plastic bottles because that's always irked me. <laughs> um, and it took us a lot of research to figure out how to kind of get the right the right thing. Um, we'll see. Um, and we actually just launched a campaign on I Fund Women um, for the bottle to get that made. So I'm super excited about that. I can't wait to get that out in the market. Um, and then we have a couple other products that we're working on in the pipeline. And then, you know, like I said, you know, the more we can do to um, be a leader in the industry around sustainability, that would make me really happy. Love it. It's, I'm going to go try your product. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty excited. All right, Lynn, look, we are reaching the end of our time here together. We like to wrap up our interviews on a, on a light note. We've talked a lot about business, about strategy, about leadership, about pivoting. Um, but, you know, we are curious what, you know, we're all in a lockdown situation. What are you doing for fun these days? <laughs> Besides drinking wine every night. Um, That's pretty fun. <laughs> no, yeah. uh, lots of virtual cocktails for sure. But I actually started doing, um, uh, well, I just finished and started another one, 30 days of yoga. Ooh. So there's um, yoga with Adrienne. It's free. She does it on YouTube. So it's great because I can work it around my schedule. 30 days of yoga. Um, so I just finished day 30 yesterday and she's got a couple different versions, like a couple yeah, different versions of those classes. So now I started the second 30 days of yoga. <laughs> but that's that's been really good because it's just, you know, you need a little like calm and a little focus, I think, amidst the chaos. What's great about yoga, even if we don't have access to a studio, there's so many great yoga instructors online and all you really need is a mat. You need a willingness and, you know, for those of us that are as inflexible as me, a block is also helpful, but but yes. you, know, you don't need too much to get started at home. Exactly. Um, so Lynn, uh, last question that we always like to ask people, if people, if folks want to follow you on, on the socials, how should they do that? Oh, that's easy. So um, I'm obviously on LinkedIn. Um, uh, I'm Lynn Powered on um, pretty much everywhere. And then my brand is Love Masami Hair everywhere. Um, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok. <laughs> um, and uh, our URL is lovemasami.com for our uh, website. And we're on Amazon. Fantastic. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. It was well, really uh, enjoyable. It was such a fun time. Really, really enjoyed it. So excited to see what the brand does next. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.